Good evening. The time is now 5.30 and we'll call the uh, January 26th Council meeting to order. Um, start off with an indication by Councilman McDaniel. Uh, great. Pray with me if you will. Uh, dear Lord, we come to you once again with something that we don't have to ask that you enter these chambers to help us make decisions for the county, help guide our hearts and our minds so we may make the best decisions that we can to improve the lives of our citizens. We ask that you help continue to guide the United States and the world through this uh, tragic pandemic that is taking hold on uh, most of our lives. Uh, we pray for those who are keeping us safe, both here and abroad. These things we ask in your name, we pray, amen. I do not join me in pleasure with this. Pleasure with this. Pleasure with this. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Just a reminder from Ms. Thanks, don't forget to turn your mics on uh, when you're ready to talk. We will start off by approval of the agenda. Um, before we get started, I, I have two amendments. Uh, first one is in uh, new business, 8D. Uh, there, and it was in your package to make on the front page of the agenda. Um, there's a discussion with a Tri County Veterans Cemetery. Do I add that to your notes? And then also a brief executive session on a contractual matter regarding the capital project sales tax. Yes, ma'am. So move to approve with me. All right. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any other discussion? Not. Please raise your right hand if you approve. Seven zero. All right. Now we will jump into the approval of minutes from the January twelfth meeting. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the January twelfth? Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Mr. Rankin. Second by Mr. McDaniel. Is there any discussion? I have a question. All right. Uh, it's on page uh, 23, and it was regarding my comment when we come on the tips. And I was attempting to explain that during the nominating of our chair and vice chair, we second the motion. And according to Robert Rule of Order, uh, doing a nomination it does not have to be second. And uh, so I just want to make sure that that's what we were supposed to be doing. Everybody knows that's what we were supposed to be doing. I'm not asking to know about uh, the election, but we don't go to second a motion, a uh, second a nomination uh, when we are nominating. Uh, Would you like something added to us here? It's just that where it is, uh, this is regarding a motion, but it's regarding the election of our chair and vice chair, that the, that the nomination of it should not have to be set by someone. All it has to do is just nominate. Long time the motion come in until you get ready to close it. All right, so we have, um... Garden motion was made. I just want to be sure we're doing the right circumstances, uh, doing the right thing in the right circumstances as relating to the election chairman. That would be appropriate. Yeah, that would be good. 
Congratulations to the uh, election officers. Uh, yeah. All right, I have an amendment. I have a second with amendment. Second. Thank you. Second by Mr. McDaniel. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Seven. All right, we'll move right into report to council. Our first is Joey Avery with a COVID 19 update. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. Uh, my presentation will be very brief. Uh, I've given you some data there to take a look at. Uh, we compile this from the information that we get from the DHEC uh, folks on a day to day basis. Uh, you can see uh, that on 123, uh, when this report was, was put together by myself, we had 840 total cases in the county. Now those are a 14 day rolling period type uh, caseload. Uh, today we only had 25 uh, cases that were reported, which was great. And out of all the data that you see here, we have it broken down by zip code. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have COVID cases pretty much in every part of the county. Um, and those numbers go up and they come down. But one thing's for sure that the virus is still consistently present in our neighborhoods and our community. But out of the most important part of this report that you get, you see at the very right hand of that first page document is the number of deaths. We've had seven deaths in the last 14 days or so. That's a lot. And um, I don't have the total number with me as far as the death that we had since the start of the COVID. But I wanted to paint that picture to you that this is a very serious virus. It's a deadly virus out there also. Um, so seven members of our community, our families, uh, we have lost to this COVID virus. And so in a nutshell, we always ask people to social distance when they can, wash your hands, don't touch your face, uh, wear a mask. The mask certainly is a proven tool that has stopped the spread of the virus in our communities. So we urge our community members to put the mask on when they're out in public uh, to help stop the spread. Um, our PPE for EMS, our EMS is running extremely hard and you will see some, some information on that here shortly. Uh, but uh, our PPE is, is uh, holding steady. We are finding that we're having difficulty finding some items that we need. Uh, we're slowly getting them in, but uh, there is still some difficulty out there getting certain items. Um, so uh, we'll keep still working hard on those to get what we need for our frontline first responders out there in the field. And that pretty much sums up that overview of COVID because we've heard a COVID re report every council meeting and I feel sure that this virus is going to be with us in quite a while. The vaccine is taking place in, in our county. There's been a good many of, uh, of our frontline uh, healthcare workers and our first responders that have taken the, the, the vaccine. Um, and we hope to see more vaccine uh, distributed here in the next few weeks and even months. So, and that's a work in progress. We all know that the distribution process is dependent upon the supply. And right now there's not enough supply to handle the distribution that's needed. So, okay. If there's any questions, I'll be glad to answer any questions at this time. First off, Joey, thank you for all you do to keep up with this. I know that's an added stress on your, your office that was not the norm. Uh, could you update us, however, on our entire organization where we sit, not on departments per se, but how many do we have out total? How are we looking? Per county? Uh, I think we still got about five people that are quarantined. Um, we actually have two department heads that's quarantined at this point in time. Uh, they're working from home and they're still, they haven't missed a beat, uh, but they're still working from home. Um, some of our family members have had students that went to school and, and were contacted, contracted in that way. Uh, but our office is pretty much our offices are pretty much holding steady at this point in time. 
uh, we've had some um, uh, offices that were completely closed and we do not have any offices that are completely closed. Uh, we do have, uh, the library has been on some, uh, some uh, hours that have reduced operations a little bit because of uh, staffing issue and the need of that still, and that still is correct. Um, they're still providing services, but because of the lack of manpower, they've had to reduce the number of hours that are actually open. So we still have people that are quarantined um, and uh, the offices are working as, as hard as they can. So. Thanks so much. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. Um, Mr. Avery, real quick. Um, do you know if the vaccine will be mandated to first responders or, you know, anything about that? How I have seen, I have seen nothing that mandates the vaccination. Okay. I certainly don't encourage the mandate. I think it's a person's individual choice if they would like to take that vaccine. But as far as my position is, I offer it to the first responders and if they're willing to take it, then I put the process in place for them to get it. But I have not seen anything mandated. And, and I would hope that we would not move into that arena to mandate the vaccine. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from Mr. Ayer? Is there any way we can help you to get the other materials we all need? Say that again, Ms. Anderson. Say, what kind of can we help you to get things that you need? Well, it's just a supply process that we're looking at. Um, EMS uh, and, and Mr. Carroll certainly can, can answer this question, but one of the, the key ingredients they use is gloves. And you guys go through those gloves like we do, not by boxes, but by cases. And, and those are the, some of the items that, that's becoming a little bit difficult to get. They're still out there and we're getting some tripled in. I may order 20 cases and get six cases. So. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Taylor. Appreciate it. All right, next we have um, EMS, and just you matter. Okay. And Ms. Pennington with EMS on a review of the operations. Oh, get Joey to help me out a little bit. Um, first part of this presentation is PowerPoint. Uh, try to keep it brief. Uh, and then we have uh, the heat maps that we want to show you that uh, Joey and I have worked on. It's kind of a pick. Can you move to the side and uh, see the camera? But they, there you go. Uh, um, I thought I could see you. <laughs> Need to comb my hair. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. That's okay. So what we're going to talk about, we're going to give you an overview of EMS. Uh, it's kind of coming along with, you know, everyone is aware that we do have a staffing issue. We do have a staffing shortage. So this is going to kind of paint a picture of how difficult it is and how hard that our people are working uh, during this pandemic and overall just in general. Because uh, you're going to see some historical data here that um, will kind of open your eyes a little bit. I uh, know it did for me a little bit as well. So just to give you a little background, back in 1976 in January, uh, Council Chairman George Penlin uh, wanted everybody to realize that at some point EMS would rely on the, would fall back on the taxpayer. It started out as a federally funded program back in 1976. Um, I'll turn this off. Sure, I think they're working. Okay, can you do that for me there, please? Okay, so Lawrence County EMS started out uh, from Shelton's Ambulance Service in January of 1976. Uh, this was a private provider uh, that uh, they give a three month trial to. Uh, the uh, contract was actually signed in February of 1976, and in May of 1976, Shelton Ambulance Service advised the council that he could no longer provide the services that they wanted without any additional funding. And in May of 1976, the county assumed operations of EMS. Uh, as you know, you can do the math, we're coming up on our 45th year. This is some of the uh, history that we have. This is from 1983. This is when the EMS headquarters was located across from the hospital on Highway 76. Um, and some of the operational uh, part components of EMS, 
Uh, they obviously operate 24 seven. Uh, they operate a 24 hour on and a 48 hour off schedule. And when we're able to, we try to consist, consistently have five ambulances operating during that time period. We have a total of 70 positions. 45 of those are full-time, which is inclusive of the administrative staff and 25 part-time positions. In 2019, 57% of our staff were paramedics. What you need to look at is in 2020, 46% of our staff were paramedics. So we had a, a, just a little over a 10% drop in paramedics in a year. Uh, and that is a trend across the country. Um, that's what we're all struggling with. And that's what we're all fighting to get is paramedics. We currently have eight vacant positions, um, but what I will tell you that goes along with this is um, at this point in our juncture, we have 97% of our EMT staff that are either just finishing halfway through or just currently enrolled in a paramedic program in the, in the upstate. So it's gonna take a little bit of time, but we're kind of growing our own. Um, some of that is through uh, tuition assistance from the county, and then some of it is also through a grant through the uh, Upper Savannah COG, Council on Government. So it works out pretty good. We're getting uh, hopefully some good people. We already know what we got because we hired them. We've been working with them for a while. We just need to get them trained up and get them out there to do the job that we need them to do. Our mission statement um, is to provide compassionate and high quality pre-hospital care in a timely manner throughout Orange County. Our highly educated professionals provide this exceptional care utilizing aggressive clinical operating guidelines and the most up-to-date technology available. And with some of that technology, some of it is grant funded, uh, and, but the majority of it is funded through council and through the uh, through taxes that are generated in the county. Some of our technology includes video laryngoscopes, uh, which allows us to actually visualize uh, intubating a patient, so there's no more what we would call blind in innovation. Um, we have state-of-the-art cardiac monitors, thanks to council and their approval with capital. We also have uh, power cots and power loads, which is going to help reduce workers' comp claims for our employees, as well as reduce the risk of dropping any patients while moving or loading. So our vision statement. Uh -oh. I'm sorry. Sorry. As the community we serve continues to grow and change, Lawrence County EMS will respond to these changes along with changes within the healthcare continuum. We will work to be a leader in evidence-based clinical practices and help to improve the lives of the citizens. We, this will be accomplished through continuous quality improvement, education, training, and research. Um, so what we do here, I think it's on the next slide, Joey, things that you may not know that we've accomplished. Many years ago, um, back when I first started in EMS, we conducted the very first pilot program for advanced airway procedures that was approved eventually by the state of South Carolina available for all providers in the state. We also facilitated the addition of fentanyl, which is a control two scheduled substance uh, that was additionally approved by the state for all South Carolina EMS agencies. And we have received the Gold Plus Mission Lifeline for the past four years. Our breakdown of our staffing, our administrative division, we have a director, a deputy director, education director, and an administrative assistant. Field operations, each shift is operated by a shift supervisor, which is also a paramedic. We have two assistant supervisors, which are also paramedics. Uh, two field training officers, which are paramedics. Field paramedics, which would consist of three, and then field EMTs for a total of six, which brings your total to 14 per shift. And that covers all of our trucks. These are some, this is some pictures of our equipment. The trailer you see there in the upper left, that was grant funding. Um, the golf cart down in the bottom left, that was also grant funding. The cardiac monitors in the top right and the ambulance were all funded by council. And those stretchers there were the ones that we just recently purchased, purchased the five new power cots that were also funded by council. Thank you. Okay, so now let's get down to the interesting part um, that hopefully will not put you to sleep. The call volume by time of day. And that's a little bit difficult to see, but going from left to right, we start at midnight to 5 a.m. and then we go to 6 to 11 and 12 
to five and six to 11. We have a four year period starting in 2017 all the way through 2020. And what you'll see is that we're pretty consistent. There are some fluctuations, but they aren't that large. So we were pretty consistent with, you know, having a drop in our call volume at night uh, with a peak obviously during the middle of the day between 12 and five. And this is the call volume by the day of the week for the same four year period. Uh, our peak day seems to be Friday, um, which, you know, Casey and I talked was a little bit odd. We figured it would be Sunday because um, over the weekend, doctor's offices aren't open and stuff like that. But Friday is our peak day followed by Wednesday. Our destination locations, these are the places that we went to or transported patients to the most during 2019. 6% of our transports went to Greenville Memorial Hospital. 10% went to Hillcrest. 70% went to Lawrence County Memorial Hospital. 6% was other, and basically what that is, that's all helicopter flights and all other facilities that were 1% or less, such as um, Mary Black and, and places like that, that we don't really frequent. And then South Regional, 8%. What you're going to see is a slight change in these numbers. This was post out of county policy that was put into place. Uh, I do expect in 21 to see a more significant drop in that. 5% um, to Greenville Memorial, 11 to Hillcrest, uh, 67 to Lawrence, 11 to other, and 6% to South Regional. So our out of counties, as far as South Regional and Greenville, decreased. But Hillcrest increased only because it's quicker for our trucks in the upper end of the county to go to Hillcrest, give their patient report, offload their patient, and get back in service for another call than it is to drive all the way back to Lawrence. So we, that's why that number increased. We told them if you're in that area, that's the hospital you need to go to because it's the closest appropriate facility. Overall call volume, just in general, for that four year period, um, 2017, 14,110. Uh, I don't really know why there was such a significant drop in 2018. I haven't been able to narrow that down and figure out why that is. Um, but, you know, it could be a simple error of pulling the data, but I, I don't really know. I don't know why the significant drop there. Back up at 14,246, and in 2020, we topped out at 14,287. So our process for hiring folks is obviously we have to recruit them from somewhere. Uh, so we go to job fairs and EMS conferences or symposiums. Uh, that is also has a, a shared cost there. Uh, we have to interview these people. Um, that takes time, takes money, takes you know, extra people. What we like to do with our interview process is we like to get our field staff involved because they're the ones that's gonna work for these people. So we want them to have a good objectionable opinion on what these people are going to be able to do. Uh, that consists of a skills assessment, which is either a written test and sometimes a hands-on practical assessment. Uh, and then you have the new hire paperwork that has to be completed, drug screens, office orientation, and field orientation. That doesn't take into account anything that HR has to do as well. So we're looking at, as far as an onboarding process, about anywhere between five to $6,000 a person to onboard somebody. And with a turnover rate of 20%, that's a, that's a significant amount of money that we're just kind of running through here because we have such a, hard, a large turnover rate. One more click, Joey. One more click. What's that? One more. So these are just some pictures that I put together um, of some things that we have done over the, over the past couple of years. Just so you can see that it's not what everybody thinks it is. We do work, they do work, they do to get out there and do extra things. They train, they teach CPR on squirreling on the square. So, you know, we, we have a need and it's a true need for more staffing. We have a need for an additional shift change, uh, which I think is gonna be the only way that we're gonna be able to recruit people. Um, it, it's, it's obvious that everybody in the state has problems recruiting through my research and through the last committee meeting that we had, it's, it's evident that you can throw money at a problem, but it's not necessarily gonna fix the problem. 
So this problem, the shift change is what I think is gonna fix where we are right now and what is gonna make our EMS system even better than what it is right now. Anybody, any questions? Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Mr. Kennedy? If not, I have a statement. Uh, I got, there was a message on the residential board here in the, uh, the county just from yesterday, and I sent this to Matt and Joey, but I want to read a portion of it for um, the community. Long for short, gentleman was having heart problems, and REMS arrived, and he outlined how they took care of me. He said their care was beyond excellent. Not only did they treat me, but they consoled and informed and reassured my wife of 30 plus years that I was going to be okay and I was going uh, to have the best care possible. They were correct. We live in a rural county, yet my very recent experience, we have an excellent, we have an excellent emergency response team of caring, well-trained professionals. I cannot give them enough praise. They saved my life. So that was just from this week um, of a incident that happened here in our county. So I want to thank you and your team. I know not everybody sees it in this world and work, but we you know, we know you do a great job and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next what we're going to show you is a heat map and it's going to kind of drive home more of a point of how busy we are and where our call volumes are. And the way this is broken down is every dot on that screen represents either a call or a series of calls. And that's really confusing there. So we're going to go down and we're going to do a heat map for you that's going to, going to show you and depict where the areas are. And we're going to do it by truck. So Medic 1 is the city truck. This is the one that's in Lawrence City. Each of those green dots is a call. What should be... What's the time frame real quick on before we get started? Is this a week's worth, a year's worth? This is a year's worth. A year's worth, thank yes. you. So what, what jumps out at me is the green dots in the Fountain Inn area, the green dots in the Cross Hill, Waterloo area, even out towards the Reno Whitmire area, because that's a truck that is stationed in Lawrence City and it's responding to those areas and the amount of time that it responds to those areas. So this is a, that's the heat map of obviously the, the, the high call volume areas are gonna be in the two cities, Lawrence and Clinton with, you know, it just goes all over the place. With, you can start to see some hints of increase in the upper areas as well. And this is the Clinton truck. This is the, the Clinton city truck. Again, if you'll look at the dots in the upper portion, Fountain Inn, Durban Creek area, all the way out to the Western Lawrence area, uh, the Wetmire, Clinton, Joanna, Cross Hill area, those are significant response times for that truck to be traveling uh, to those calls that, that, for service that people need. Again, and this, this one really surprised me because you can, you can really see how hot that upper Great Court Fountain Inn area is. That's just with that truck that's in the Great Court area. Um, it doesn't get down south much, I guess, because it's so busy up north. But it, it does travel down there. And this is the Cross Hill truck. And you still see this truck is still traveling to the Great Court Fountain Inn area. And, you know, I did it when I was on the truck and that's been many years ago. And it is a long ride from Cross Hill to Great Court or even to Fountain Inn. And we have to do it, but it just takes time. The next truck, Medic 5, that is our second truck that we have in Lawrence City. Um, they did the dots in black again. Fountain Inn, Great Court, Cross Hill, Waterloo. Our trucks go everywhere. It's just the amount of times that they go there and the amount of time it takes to get there. Are there any questions on the, on the maps and any Anything related to the call volume? Uh, do you think that's a possibility of all these variables because of the age population of our 
uh, community and the number of nursing homes that we have uh, here in the county. Um, this is probably the reason place for the real high call volume. I, I believe it would be in the city of Lawrence and Clinton, but not in the Greyport Fountain area because we do not cover any nursing homes in that area. The only nursing home in that area is in Bremen County, nor, nor are there any in uh, Waterloo or Cross Hill. We have around about five, six. Yeah, we, we do have a significant amount, and, and that I do contribute that to some of the high call value in the two cities, but not for the, uh, not for the northern and southern end. There, there's just a huge amount of growth especially in the northern end, but I think there's also some growth in the southern end. Obviously, during the summertime, you have the people on the lake and stuff like that, so that is going to increase your call volume as well during that time. And do, you, do, do you feel like, um, as far as service-wise, uh, since Prisma is over most of all these hospitals, that everything moves a lot smoother than if it had been like it was in the past with Lawrence at there, where they their protocol and field present their protocol. You feel like it's easier what you're doing? The, the, the processes? The protocol as far as what each facility will accept is is set um, number one by the state. You know, Lawrence's hospital is not designated as a trauma center, it's not designated as a stroke or a trauma center. Now Lawrence has upped their game and now we can take certain stroke patients to Lawrence, um, but they still may be transferred out. But our main goal is to get them to the closest facility in the shortest amount of time. Um, but some of the processes that Prisma is doing will help our response. Uh, for example, they when you call a report into Prisma, if you're going to downtown to the main campus, you call into what they call a comm center and they have paramedics in there that take those calls and triage them. And then they place them in a room at that hospital. Well, what they recently did is they said, okay, all calls that go to Hillcrest Hospital will now come through the comm center. And Hillcrest doesn't have the ability to say, no, we won't take that patient. That patient goes there unless they need a higher level of care that they can't provide. They're doing Greer. They're adding Greer Hospital on, I think, the 24th of this month. Or they did add them on the 24th of this month. And I think Lawrence is supposed to be next. But one of the other things that kind of helped us out a little bit, too, is DHEC recently issued out a memorandum that said no hospital can divert a patient if they're the closest appropriate facility and that's the patient's choice. They can't divert for any reason unless it's clinical. And, you know, obviously we're not going to take a, a trauma patient to Lawrence, but if Lawrence can handle it, they can't turn us away unless it's clinical. Are there any other questions for Matt? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joey, for those maps. Yes, sir. I, have the, I got the maps for that, Joey's help. Thank you. All right, next thing we have, uh, well, for the next one, we're going to have a bunch of committee uh, approval. We'll start with Andy on the Agricultural Center Advisory Committee. Okay, Council. Um, we actually come together or put together a, a committee for the Ag Center, um, and I did so. You got those in your packets. Um, I will say the the people: Dr. John Irwin, Annette Bodie, Mason Addy, Jay Wham, and Ellington Willis. Um, there was a little confusion between Mr. Johnson and myself about the uh, Ellington Willis. He wanted to appoint the the husband and I was looking to appoint the wife, but we didn't realize it was the same family. So the one that Kemp was going to um, nominate bowed out for his wife to be on there. Um, yes, there's more those absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it, it worked out. Um, obviously, those names are very well known in the agricultural community, um, and I think this is a perfect a perfect committee for for the ag center. Wonderful. All right, well, you've heard the recommendation from uh, Mr. Howard. Uh, do I have a motion to approve uh, the names he submitted? Motion to approve. I have a motion from uh, Mr. Carroll, and a second from Ms. Anderson. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. Thank I'll be you. Here next on a 
implementation plan for the airport. Yes, the, the airport implementation plan for the capital sales tax is kind of di dictated by the FAA and the way that we receive funding from them. So the project is going to be, we'll receive allocations for this year um, and we'll receive allocations for the following year and then we will start construction after that. However, the capital sales tax funds, a portion of those will be needed early on so that we can go ahead and do the designing um, and the bidding process. Um, but we, at the same time, we also have to keep these, these grant funds separate um, because there's state money involved, there's federal money involved, and of course there's capital sales tax money involved. So we're gonna try to proportion it where this amount of money pays for this portion, this amount of money pays for this portion, this amount of money pays for this portion. It's, it's not unheard of, but it is difficult and we'll make it happen. But we're looking at probably a start date of 2022. Um, before we can get started on actual breaking ground. All right. And that would be late 2022. Okay. All right. Is, do you need any action from us tonight on this, or is this just an update to the implementation plan for Mr. King? My, this is for the website, so it doesn't necessarily need council's approval. It's just a, a way that we're going to continue to uh, to implement transparency on uh, on the capital sales tax as we go through implementation. All right. Well, then I have to say, Andy, as soon as you're ready for your uh, engineering and drawings, bring whatever you need back to us, and we'll go from there. We'll do it. All right. Thank, Thank you, you Councilor. All right. Next, we have uh, Dale uh, to discuss with us the uh, store courthouse advisory committee. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you directed me at the last meeting. I have assembled a committee for the uh, historic courthouse division and the planning of that building. Uh, the committee is uh, Mayor Nathan Sin, uh, who represents city council as mayor at the business district. Amanda Munyon uh, with the uh, city of Lawrence and with the chamber with her expertise in business economic development background. <clears throat> Chairperson Diane Anderson who would be representing uh, the eastern part of Lawrence County and council. Uh, Chief Chrissy Lattimore, representing the city of Lawrence, background in public safety and community relations. Uh, Jamie Field, who is the wife of uh, Jeff Field at Lawrence County Water and Sewer. She has a uh, rich uh, background in architectural design and experience and represents the western part of our city. Uh, Robert Whitmore, who is, uh, represents the northern part of Lawrence County, but is also uh, very committed and interested in history as he volunteers with our museum. And then there will be two ex officio members, uh, our county administrator, Mr. Kamey, and myself. All right, two things that I do with really on Ms. Munions here. She's not necessarily representing the city. She just happens to live in the right. city. Right, that's correct. Um, I just want to make that notation. The city representatives are... Uh, yeah. Chief Lattimore and Mayor Sim. Um, I have one more request for this particular committee uh, for Council Member Luke Rankin. He wanted to participate on this, representing Absolutely. the far western side of Lawrence County. Okay. Um, we can add him to that little list. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Right. So you have heard the names presented before you. Do I have a motion to approve uh, the names on the list, including Mr. Rankin's? Motion to approve. Motion from Mr. Carroll. Second. Second from Mr. McDaniel. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes 7 0. All right. Next report and the last one are the County Council Committee assignments. Uh, you have them in your packet, um, but I will read them aloud for those in the audience and the, the media. Um, the Committee on Budget and Finance will include uh, Mr. Carroll, Chairman, Mr. McDaniel, and Mr. Rankin. Committee on Economic Development, uh, Mr. McDaniel as Chairman. All Mr. Tribble and Mr. Yance. A committee on Public Works, Mr. Tribble as Chairman, along with Ms. Anderson and Mr. Yance. A committee on Health, Welfare, and Emergency Services, Mr. Carroll as Chairman, along with Ms. Anderson and Mr. Rankin. A committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety, uh, Mr. McDaniel as Chairman, along with Mr. Carroll and Mr. Tribble. A committee on Parks, Rec, and Tourism and Natural Resources, uh, Ms. Anderson as Chairwoman, along with Mr. Rankin and Mr. Yance. Committee on Planning and Intergovernmental Affairs, Mr. Tribble as Chairman, along with Mr. Carroll and Mr. McDaniel, 
And that is always council committee as a whole for when we need that. Uh, we will now move into old business, uh, which will be the county appointed boards, commissions, and committees. So I'm going to try to do this the best way we can. We're going to approve each of these individually, um, each commission, not just each individual appointee. Um, there still are a few um, spots to fill in, and we will continue to fill those in as, as we go. Um, I believe the ordinance we passed at the last meeting said 90 days uh, from January 1. So after the uh, March meeting and the April meeting, any spots that are still available will be able to be nominated by any member of the council. So we'll, we'll work, all work together to try to get these filled between uh, now and then. Um, on the airport commission, uh, I'm just going to read the new members because some of these are already, um, they were appointed two years ago and they're still serving down their term. Um, but uh, I have a Mr. Mitchell, John Mitchell from Mr. McDaniel district, um, uh, Richard Patterson from Ms. Anderson's district, and it's not on the sheet, but uh, Sammy Wham from Mr. Triple's district, uh, he is looking to reappoint him. So here are those new recommendations. We can uh, uh, have a motion to approve the members of the Airport Commission. Motion to approve. Motion from Mr. Rankin. Second. Second from Mr. Carroll. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Seven zero. All right, next is the Gateway Alcohol and Drug Abuse uh, Committee. Um, the only new one I have on here right now is a uh, reappointment is Ms. Holman, Jessica Holman from Ms. McDaniel District. Uh, I know some others are still working on uh, theirs, and there are two at large seats. So, anybody, if you have a recommendation from anywhere in the county, we can fill those in at a later date. Uh, so, a motion to approve the Gateway Alcohol and Drug Abuse Committee uh, with the current members on there, please. We'll have a motion. So, so second. Motion from Mr. McDaniel, second from Mr. Carroll. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. 7 0. Uh, assessment of Bills Board. Um, the new members uh, are from my district, uh, Clay Riker, uh, reappointed from Ms. Anderson's district, uh, Mr. Berg Jr., Elis Berg Jr., and uh, a reappointment from Mr. McDaniel's uh, district, uh, Mr. Brickett. Uh, are there any? Uh, do I have a motion to approve those new? Uh, Board members. Motion different. Motion by Mr. Rankin. Second. Second by Mr. Carroll. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All right. Seven up. Uh, construction Board of Appeals. Uh, new ones uh, Mr. McDaniel, John Aiken, uh, and from my district, uh, Mr. Jeremy Hudson, uh, from Ms. Anderson's district, Raphael Jenkins. All those, do I have a motion to approve those? There's two previous chairmen. Mr. Mr. Carroll. Second. Second for Ms. Anderson. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. So no. Uh, that is also another committee that has two at large seats that we'd be happy to take any recommendation from members of council. Um, Disability and Special Needs Board. New appointments. Uh, Ms. Brenda Ligon from Mr. McDaniel. Uh, Ms. Ben Beasley from Ms. Anderson's district. Do I have a motion to approve those? Motion to approve. Motion from Mr. Carroll. Second. Second from Mr. Ryan. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Seven up. All right. I'm sorry, guys. Some of these. Uh, library board, new appointment from Mr. Rankin, uh, Amy Adams, uh, Mr. McDaniel, Sandra Power, uh, and from Ms. Anderson, Velma Alston. Ms. Uh, Alston, Ms. Walsh, I got a spelling on there. That's my fault. Velma Alston has two S's. Um, do I have a motion to approve those appointees? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Carroll. Second. Second by Mr. Rankin. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. So no. Uh, planning Commission. Uh, new appointments by Mr. Casey Robinson from, that is a Mr. Right? That's right. Okay, that's right. Mr. Casey Robinson. He was, from, he was here with us. Tonight. Oh, is he? Oh, yes. I didn't see you out there. I'm so sorry. Um, Mr. McDaniel, District George Austin. Uh, from Ms. Anderson's district, uh, Sylvester Grant. Uh, from Mr. Tribble's district, and this, you want to write this in, Mr. Abney Smith. I'll make a motion to approve that motion. Motion for Mr. Carroll, Planning Commission. Second. Second for Mr. Rankin. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Seven, nine. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, if Mr. Rankin and Mr. Tribble's uh, appointee, if you could please give me those contact information, I'd appreciate that. All right, uh, Committee on Park Direct Tourism and Natural Resources. Uh, the new ones uh, for Mr. Rankin, uh, Thomas Stevenson, Mr. McDaniel, uh, 
Well, that's Mr. Hill and Ms. Anderson, Donna Hickenbottom, oh, and Mr. Trevor, uh, Mr. Bud Marshall. We have a motion to approve the Park Rec Tourism Committee. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Rank. Second. Second by Mr. Kerr. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Thank you. I know that was uh, hard. And those, the lines that are still left, we can on getting those in as soon as possible. And just for record, uh, all the council districts two, three, six, and seven that just got elected or re elected, those terms expire December 31st, 2024. All right. We will move on to the um, health meeting. This is a portion of old business that was tabled from the November meeting. Um, here in the November meeting, there was much discussion. I uh, believe the motion on the table was to read it correctly. You have much discussion. <laughs> All right. The motion from the committee that was, uh, came out of committee did not need a second uh, to consider to approve the position of the EMT uh, $1,500 and increased mayor, paramedics $3,000 uh, with no change of the scheduling until council can discuss in more detail during the budget session. Um, that motion was tabled by vote of four to three, so we are now bringing it back up uh, for this meeting. I will recognize uh, anybody who wishes to speak. Mr. Chair. Yes, ma'am. Um, since in two more months, March, if I'm not mistaken, I know Mr. Kenny is very, working very hard on it, uh, we will be looking at our budget. And also, we have requested and put up, put out the bid. Um, now we probably got the bid back. So we, we're looking at um, doing a salary adjustment for the, I don't know if we're going to do it for the coming year, but we have requested it. So would it be in order? if we would address those particular things in our budget time so we can have all those things without us just making suggestions to up those salaries when you're gonna try to look at everybody's salary at the same time. I th because even this past week, we've already received information from the Treasurer's office. The Treasurer's office yes, requesting uh, a look at the salaries. And I think we need to look at the salaries as a whole and not as haphazard as we might look at them if we look at this today and this the next time. Because what we have done already is we, I think we need to stay within the budget that we've already set for this year since we're so close to that we out at least seven or eight months. Next week this time, it'll be February. And so I feel like we need to just wait until we can address all those particulars at our budget session time. We usually take a lot of time to go through this and we uh, look at very um, strictly and I think with us keeping everything on, on the same shelf, we can make a good decision that would um, help everybody. All right. Thank you for those comments. Anybody else? Yeah. I'll harken back to the conversations we had back when we discussed this uh, in November. And the issue was staffing and call volume and schedules and being competitive. And we are no better today than we were then. As a matter of fact, we may have lost some. And the issue still is uh, being competitive with compensation, even to get us to budget time and to get us to the market adjustment study, which will be, I think, in the base. So it'll be the end April before we know anything on that, and we definitely need to shore up our EMS. We're doing what we can uh, with partnerships and with uh, overtime and things like that, but we are still behind in salary. So I would still say that we need to address the EMT and paramedic salaries and the $1,500 starting for EMTs and the $3,000 across the board for paramedics. 
which I discussed last time, I still think we need to do that. I have a question. Is this increase, would this be matching Greenville's pay, or is that? It would still be behind Greenville. Do, you, do we know like how much? Yes, but I don't want to speak to specifics of their uh, range, but they are their paramedics are closer to 50,000 and we are at 44,000. So this would put us at 47,000, which would still be below uh, what most people are in the study that we're going to find, because we have one done in, in the county that I work in, um, was that uh, market was a shade below Greenville. They shot, they're, they're above market, I believe, uh, only in some places, but we are behind market. And you'll see that come April. Okay. Mr. Trill. Mr. Chairman, I, I was interested in the, the treasurer's report and, and her um, effort to put forth the, the value of the work that, that her department's done, and she did a good job of that. You know, as a, as a business person, you would recognize that, that pay is not a reward for work. You, you pay to attract and retain, and that we can hire all the people in the treasurer's department at what we're paying. Everybody's there. Everybody reported to work. We can't attract and retain at the price that we are now. It's like saying that we we're we only going to pay $1.50 for gas. Well, there's no gas out there at $1.50. You won't be able to buy it. You won't be able to buy enough of it to do what you have to do. And that's where we are with this. And we've been, and, and this is deja vu, guys. I mean, this is the discussion when I left 10 years ago. It's like I went to sleep and I woke up, got the same item on the agenda. So, I mean, there's no reason to ignore the fact that, that the market has spoken and that you can't pretend like you didn't. Are there any other comments? Hey, what kind of turnover do you have? It's only compared to other counties, you know? Compared to the other counties, I don't know, but we're 20% turnover. Any case you Mr. Carroll, you know, you want to speak on the what other counties may be doing? So it will vary. Um, if you have a larger county, we spoke to Greenville a minute ago, but Greenville's much larger. And so there, if they lost eight employees, it would not be near the impact that eight employees at Lawrence is. And so comparatively, if they were to have lost 20% of their staff, that would be huge for them. And I mean, any percentage is huge when you need them, but 20% in a smaller county like we have, is huge. It's almost an entire shift of employees. And so to quantify it, I mean, it, if you were at a larger place, it's all scale. Um, but I think Lawrence has been hit harder than most of the others just because we have a, a smaller number of, of people available and every person we lose is uh, is not equivalent to a Spartanburg wrinkle that loses one. It's not the same as Lawrence losing one. Uh, there's just more impact. So that 20% in our community is really high. Are they leaving a better job to the EMS in another county? They're going to other counties. Uh, they're, <clears throat> they're going to other counties to work less hours and make more money. And less call volume. So we just try them in another county to get them Pretty much. And, and that's kind of been the consensus of how Lawrence has operated for years is that we have always been the training ground for every other system in the state. People come here from out of state, we train them, we get new employees, we train them, and they go to Greenville for 12 hour shifts, they go to Greenwood or go to Saluda to run less call volume and make more money or make the same amount of money with less stress and less call volume. Uh, Matt, speaking on that matter of curiosity, I know the Sheriff's Department, say we hire somebody from Saluda County tomorrow, and they've only been there for six months, we have to pay Saluda County at training fee, for lack of better words, to all set their cost that they pay to train their employees. Does anything like that exist in the EMS? I'm not aware of that. That's a, that's a statutory provision. Oh, okay. Is that, okay. Yeah, the state the state dictates that as far as uh, law enforcement. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Yeah, I'm because um, I agree with David to a certain extent, and that's why we have been addressing it every since off and on for a while. This is not uh, something that just happened this, you know, this year. 
in 2021. We discussed, like we are saying, we discussed this in 2020, and it was discussed in 2018, and we have uh, improved the salary. I'm not against uh, giving not upping your salary to a certain degree, but I, I cannot see us comparing uh, Lawrence County with Greenville County. That's not comparing apples with apples. You comparing apples with oranges. They're a whole different ball game. And I and I understand the fair market game. And uh, but I just really think um, that we just need to work on this. Because I think when you first came to us, it was not for pay. It was for a change in shift. That's why the group met together was for a change in shift not for an increase in pay. And I don't think we have addressed what you came and sought us for if we just paying you for your Yeah, he didn't come asking for money. That was from me. I know, that's what I'm saying. And so um, I, I said, uh, but we are not addressing exactly what he called the meeting for. He called the meeting to change the ship so we can make sure we are accommodating the citizen of the county. Well, but what come out of the meeting is a raise in pay based on the market value. Because I know, you know, we have been working with uh, the, uh, your department, the EMS, to make sure that we are looking for paramedics and trying to groom people to keep people. We've been doing everything we can. If you look at those eight vacancies, those eight vacancies we've had, we've had for the last two or three years. We have never had a full slate of paramedics and um, the other thing. We never have. And I don't think we ever will. But I'm hoping that we will. I'm hoping that we can transfer. I'm hoping that after this conference, I think everything will change. I think everything will look different. And uh, I'm hoping that people will see the need and uh, jump on board and know that we can help people that way. And I, 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 I really want us to, I really would have liked that committee to address the need that that, why they went there and not come out of the committee with a pay. Well, I, I think, Ms. Anderson and Mr. McDaniel, who was the committee chairman of the state, I feel that they did address that pretty well and the, the determination was that the 2472 schedule was not beneficial to our county at this time. So I think that issue was addressed. The decision just wasn't per se what he asked for when he came to the meeting. But I would argue, Mr. McGann would speak on this committee, but I would argue they did address the problem, or address the issue that was brought before them and determined that the solution being presented was not the proper solution for Lawrence County. But I'll let Mr. McDaniel. We definitely addressed the problem, and I don't remember the specific numbers. Uh, Matt, if you can help refresh. Converting to a well, 2472 would have been a, I think it was a $100,000, $150,000 annual increase. No, converting, adding a, a complete shift to our roster, which would be another 14 people, is going to annually going to be around seven hundred to $800,000. Which was not feasible at the time. So what we came up with as the committee was a stopgap measure until we can revisit that uh, at budget time. And then what I was going to say was, I, I definitely agree with Ms. Anderson. I'm not a fan of adjusting much, especially salaries mid budget year. Uh, there's a reason we have a extenuating budget process to address those issues. However, this did come out of committee as a recommendation, and it was a stopgap to keep from losing people more than anything. Um, and I definitely agree we do not need to compare ourselves to Greenville. We will never be Greenville County. Don't want to be Greenville County, but I also don't want to be Bonneville either. Um, I feel like there's a nice middle ground we can find ourselves in um, between here and there, but uh, this was tabled uh, to be brought back up this meeting. So at this time, I will entertain any motion if there is one. Okay. Can I say something about the comparison? Sure. Go ahead. Counties? Well, I understand we can't compare to Greenville. They are our direct competitor along with Greenwood and Spartanburg and other counties. Uh, you know, Comparison with other Group 3 counties, I believe the only Group 3 county that we are very closely related to is Greenwood. Um, so th those are our direct competitors, uh -huh. even though it's not apples to apples. And I would say Greenwood, Greenwood, Spartanburg, Union, I mean, those are who we're competing to. And we are in a, in a market area because I think we, before you used some comparison for Darlington, 
I would argue that's not our competition because they're too far away. It's so I do agree right. that we are competing with Greenville, but they have a plenty more resource than we do. There's just no way we can compete. But I think we could get become fair to the market, and I think that's what we're attempting to do to do here. Um, so once again, if there uh, is a motion on this, we will take one. If not, we will proceed to the next agenda item. I would like to make a motion that we increase the starting EMT pay by fifteen hundred dollars. And if that impacts any current EMTs, that we bring them up to that level, and that we give a three thousand dollar increase to all paramedics uh, in Lawrence County. Sorry. I have a motion from Mr. Carroll, a second from Mr. Yonks, uh, just to restate the motion. Uh, the motion was to increase EMT salaries fifteen hundred dollars and paramedic salaries three thousand dollars. That was starting on the EMT Sorry. and any EMT that ends up below the new starting would be brought to that. But the paramedic level, all current paramedics, certified paramedics in Lawrence County that are full time would get three thousand dollar increase in salary. All right. Is there any we've had plenty of discussion. Is there any more discussion? I just point of clarification. I thank you for that clarification on that piece, but this would be based on the regular hours. Correct. Yes. Anything further? If not, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Anderson no, abstains. So the vote will be uh, six to zero to one. All right. That passes. Congratulations, Matt. Please let your, your folks know. I hope this will uh, keep us from losing some and like Ms. Anderson did say before, we have eight positions that have been vacant for going on to over two years now. Um, I know y'all struggle and I hopefully this will maybe bring a few more in. And I, I kind of agree with that. I don't know what it will be I know we would love to be, but anything would help. So thank you for all the hard work your folks do. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next we have third reading ordinance on uh, Vulcan land transfer. And Mr. Kirkshank, just for clarification, we did conduct public hearing properly. Yes, yeah. we did. All right. So uh, you saw your ordinance in your packet. Do I have a motion to approve the ordinance on the Vulcan land transfer? Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Rankin. Second. Second by Mr. McDaniel. Is there any discussion? I do have a couple things I'd like to say. Um, in a perfect world, we could move the convenience center somewhere that had zero impact on our citizens, that only gave benefit and didn't have any uh, negative things such as traffic or trash or anything like that. We just don't have that luxury. We look, there's not available land to put it someplace like that. Uh, so it is where it is today. We have a couple options. We either approve this and get a new facility adjacent to the same site, and it gives benefit of better traffic flow, new equipment, and things that are possible. Uh, what it doesn't do is move it. But we have heard um, pleas from the people in the community that are impacted currently by the facility, as well as some school impact, trash, and traffic that I think we still have some work to do to help them. And I think we can as a county uh, council do that. Uh, but today I think for me, the best option would be to approve this, to get that site moved, to get it more appropriate for the community and then do things we can to help them with their access, egress, the trash and, uh, and that situation with the school. So that's what I uh, Mr. Carroll, has uh, anything been addressed as far as that traffic pattern uh, is there anything in place where we can help with that? Are you speaking to the trash itself or the school? I'm talking about the school, the school traffic, how back still to operate in that chair. Um, I actually was at a school board meeting last night, and while they were in executive session, I had talked with several of their higher ups, and they are looking at options, um, trying to get a basically a traffic loop on their property. They have a good section of property there. It all boils down to money, to be honest. I, I, I don't foresee it happening in the immediate future, but they are. Uh, I stress the importance of it, and they are they have been considering it and have looked into it since I asked them the first time this came up. After surveying the area, I definitely agree that I understand the concerns of the community where it would be a problem. So, but they are working on that, and I'll continue to encourage them to do so. Is there any other discussion? 
Um, I do want to add a little bit to Mr. Carroll. Um, we have implemented, and I don't remember the schedule, but a cleanup period for that road specifically, as well as some of our other uh, locations to do a better job. We've addressed uh, some issues with speed with all of our staff, um, and we're continuing to look at other options uh, for addressing it with the community uh, members. But uh, we are where we are today, and uh, I'll be voting in favor of this this evening. If nothing else, I will call for the vote. All those in favor of approving ordinance number 887, please raise your right hand. Vote passes 7 0. All right, next we will go to the second reading of ordinance 889, which is a transfer of the Hayes Station property. And I will call on our family attorney to elaborate on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you will notice from the last, from the first reading, we did make some modifications and added some additional information for the benefit of council as to the background of the Hayes Station property. Um, in addition, we have kind of gotten uh, the, the caretaker that's, that's been taking care of that uh, site for the last several years. Many of you know Eddie McGee. Um, Eddie's been taking care of uh, Bush Hogan and, and cleaning up around there. And uh, we, we got uh, Mr. McGee in touch with the folks uh, at the Preservation uh, Trust, and uh, they had talked with each other about uh, the arrangements they're making there. We've also talked with the landowner that owns the land surrounding the site. So I, I think if all the pieces are in place to move this forward and put it in the hands uh, of an organization that can uh, maintain this and, and keep it uh, what it is. Uh, in perpetuity, so I, I think this is this is a good move. Good move, and I, I'm, I'm glad to see the conversations. Uh, like I said, the landowners called me and talked to me at length about it. Uh, Mr. McGee and I visited, and, and so I, I think the, the pieces are falling together to where this uh, Revolutionary War site will, will will be there and be preserved uh, in perpetuity. And we would encourage second meeting approval of um, ordinance. 889. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chris. Does anybody have any questions or is there any discussion on this particular item? Where is this uh, truck located? Where is it located? Out yonder. I know what the field is. I'm talking about the south side of the Is it? Oh, they're, they're headquarters are in Charleston. Yeah, they're Charleston. Yes, ma'am. They're in Charleston. Yeah, I think they're headquarters are in Charleston. Yeah, they're in Charleston. Yes, ma'am. They're in Charleston. And, and, and I have invited the uh, CEO, president, whatever his title is, to, to come up for a public hearing the third reading act so that everybody can, can beat him. And I've also asked Mr. McGee uh, to, to attend because I, those of you that don't know, Eddie, Eddie was a, a DNR agent for 100 years, I reckon. Uh, but uh, he became uh, aware of that site because that was one of the areas that, that he patrolled uh, with. with when he was an agent, so uh, he'd be very familiar with it and, and volunteered to, to help out. So I, I think it's a great thing. All right, any other questions? I just have a statement. Um, I struggle heavily with this, um, especially the third or fourth, whereas uh, the county has ownership of the property. Um, I understand that the Historic Preservation Commission disbanded but if the county is going to gain ownership of every nonprofit that disbands in the county and then give their property away, I just feel like it's setting that precedent. I, I do, I'm excited that there is an organization looking to take over this uh, historical battleground and preserve it uh, for future generations so they can learn and remember history. Um, I do personally struggle with the ability of the county to give the property away. So that's all I have to say there. But there's no other discussion. I will call for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, vote passes on second reading of ordinance 889, six to one, Patterson in opposition. Did we get motion in a second? Did I just miss that? I, I was just going to uh, uh, push the vote. I don't uh, think I don't think it was a motion. I'm sorry to interrupt. Thank you for stopping us. We'll do this one more time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a motion for the approval of ordinance number 889. I move for approval of ordinance 889. I have a motion for Ms. Anderson. Second for Mr. Carroll. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed. 
Motion passes six to one. Patterson in opposition. Thank you, Mr. Kennedy, for catching that. All right, next we have Project Delta, ordinance number, uh, second reading Project Delta, ordinance number 890. I'm not sure if you had anything. Else. Yes, Mr. Chairman, the last meeting, uh, Council approved that on first reading by title only. Uh, this is just, to, and you see now you've got some, uh, some uh, text there to, uh, to read. This is an existing industry. They have committed to the minimum of 2.5 million. Uh, this industry in the past has invested upwards of 45 million uh, here in the county. So I, I think it's in good hands uh, and, and certainly recommend recommendation from the uh, developer corporation and uh, from, from my viewpoint that this uh, second meeting uh, should go forward for Project Delta. We will reveal the uh, name of the company uh, at the public hearing and third reading, which will be coming up February 9th. All right. Y'all heard the recommendation by the county attorney. You'll have a motion for approval of ordinance number 890, Project Delta. Motion to approve ordinance 890, Project Delta, second reading. Mr. Carroll. Second. Second by Mr. McDaniel. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Vote passes 7 0. Uh, next, I'll call again on the county attorney for a second reading of ordinance 891. And if I'm not mistaken, first reading on this was by title only also. This is a conversion. Uh, many of you have been on council for, for a while. Uh, have heard me talk about the old lease back arrangements for uh, fee and lieu. When, when the, the fee and lieu concept came out, uh, that was the only way that uh, the legislature thought you could do it was that the county owned the land and we leased it back to the company and then they paid a fee uh, based on that. It was a very cumbersome process. It has now been streamlined to the, uh, under the Simplified uh, Fee Act. This is one of, I think we may have one more remain. Uh, and, and it's a great day that we can get rid of these old cumbersome things. What, what will happen in the process as we get to third reading and all, you will see a lot more paperwork. We will be terminating a lease agreement. Uh, we will be transferring the property, which is in the name of Lawrence County. If you look at this site uh, for uh, ISO Poly, which is in the uh, Great Fort area, uh, it, you will see it's not an ISO property, it, it, it's in Lawrence County. So we will be transferring that property pursuant to the original agreement in 1998 uh, back to the company uh, uh, in exchange for uh, getting all this paperwork out of the way where it will be a simplified process. We will not have to be involved. We have been involved three times with ISO Poly in refinancing of the industry which required us to sign off on and meet with and talk with the bankers um, that, that we really didn't need to be involved in, but, but that was the way it was. So this will be a conversion to the simplified fee, um, and, and we will uh, we will have the public hearing third reading on that on February 9th. So we would encourage second reading approval of uh, ordinance uh, 891. All right, you've heard the recommendation of the county attorney. Do I have a, a motion for second reading approval of ordinance 889 or 891? Excuse me. Mr. Chairman, I move for second reading approval of ordinance 891. I have a motion by Ms. Anderson. Second. Second by Mr. McDaniel. All those, are there any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. 7 0. All right, I'll call up the county attorney for a approval of draft and random of understanding. What, uh, what we brought to you, and you heard some discussion earlier, uh, particularly with uh, Mr. Howard, talking about the airport and the various funds that will be involved there. Uh, this, we, we brought you a sample of, and I just happened to, to pick Grayport, uh, the town of Grayport project. This is kind of what we will put out for each one of the projects, including the projects that the county will be administering. Uh, that will, will further detail, uh, for example, and I'll use the airport, that uh, X dollars is coming from here, and X dollars is coming from there, and when they need the money, when they expect the project to be completed. What we're trying to do, in, in addition to the implementation plan that Mr. Kennedy has laid out, is to kind of try to, to tie our own hands and then those 
agencies that are dealing with other projects that have been approved under capital project sales tax to, to make them sure that they understand this is all the money they get. This is what their project is about. And we're going to have a, a separate sheet for draws. So when they contact the treasurer and say, hey, we need a million dollars, what they're going to have to do as far as the protocol is concerned, the same would apply to the county as it would to the city of Clinton, the great court, or anybody else. Uh, the other thing will be to have kind of a list of contact information. Uh, Mr. Kennedy mentioned that tonight with, with some of the commission members. Uh, that's important. Who, who, we, who we call, who does our oversight people call if something's going haywire with the project? Um, so we're going to have all of that put together. This, this is a sample. Each one will be tailored exactly for that particular project. So it won't look exactly like this, but general, this is the general concept. Right. And, and if, we, if council wishes, we can bring each one of those individually back as we develop them. I just wanted y'all to see tonight. I, it, it really, it doesn't need necessarily have approval uh, tonight. I, I just wanted you to see a sample of it. And if that's okay, if there are other changes you want to make, please, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to reinvent the wheel, but this is kind of a new thing. So we want to make sure we do it right. Uh, I have two questions, um, and then I did not pull the original ordinance out to read it in its entirety, but it outlined the specific people who were allowed to negotiate contracts, land purchases, so on and so forth. For the, the project manager and the county treasurer, are they this legally bind this document by them signing, or do we need to add one of the specified people? Well, I, I think, and I think that's a good point. I think we need where there is a, a contractor involved or, or a project director. Uh, other than just a general overseer, uh, those contracts would be bound through the county, through the regular contractual procedures that the council has to authorize Mr. Kennedy or his designee to sign off on contracts and things of that nature. And any any that are the counties, the correct county, the end correct would come to council. And we would do the same for the city of Clinton, Clay Court, uh, and so, so we know who who has the authority to sign. Okay. Yeah, we're good on our side for these, and they use for the outside entities. Yes. Okay. And then the only other request I would have, if we could change something, is the number ten at the end, where it asks for it be completed on or before, and then they would specify the date. Mm -hmm. Could we also put something there for an extension? Uh, the extension must be filed, let's say, ninety days before the completion date. Because if, if there's let's, let's honest, sure. sure, everybody remember. Yeah, but or, or it could rain for two months in a row. And then right. I, have no problem. So I, sure. I would like to give these other entities okay. the option for extension just, just to be safe. And I would ask council too if, it be, if you have any other suggestions. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I take no pride in, in, in authorship, but I'm glad to add uh, things. We, we just want it to where it's not only transparency, but where, where the information is there so that all parties are aware of what's going on and, and how it's going to work. And, Nobody's surprised. So those are great suggestions, and, and I'll, I'll note those. All right. Yeah, just to get a consensus from council, and you, you're welcome to comment on the document itself. Do we want to see each one? There should be seven. How many other entities are there? We'll have four external, <laughs> four or five four, external. Four external. There will only be a four council one review each 14 one. Fourteen internal. As well, they come up. Well, yeah, 12, that's right. So the 12 internal will be handling ourselves, so there will be four of these. It'll be made. Do we want to address each one independently or give the county attorney the ability just to work them out? I really don't know that at the present time, but I do know um, it's going to be county, it's the county responsibility. It all falls back on county action. So I want to make sure that we're conscious of what we're doing because some other people have had one penny bill tax and they have gone over and things have gone wrong. Okay. I don't mind. So I, I don't mind bringing those back. To, and to so I want to make sure whatever we do, and we making sure that we are walking down the right track and correct All right. Well, on that note, then, uh, Mr. Kirk, I said, we'll just as each one's ready, yes. the council approve each one. Uh, does anybody have any comment on the, the content of it? Does anybody like to see yeah. added or taken away or anything of that sort? Should be even I'd be glad to. Add it in and we'll uh, circulate it around those camps. Drive those good. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. All right, we'll move into new business. The first one's approval 
Um, there's, there's two approval for the Savannah. The first one will address a uh, council appointee uh, in your packet. There's a section of emails and then the outline of the their board of directors establishments. Um, just for reference, uh, the county currently has from county council's side, um, Ms. Diane Anderson, who also served on their executive board, um, Councilman McDaniel, um, Mr. John Carter from Gray Court, and then Mr. Ernie Seekers. Um, as you read there, their emails when they responded to us, uh, the county council is entitled to three appointees based on our uh, population size. Uh, so I would like to nominate Mr. David Trill as our third county council appointee for that uh, committee. Do we need a second, Mr. Kirkshanks? Uh, in, in my opinion, you can do it either way. Um, I think from a standpoint of, of, of consensus, consistency, I would like to have a second. I will entertain a second. I second that nomination. A second for Mr. Carroll. All those in favor of appointing Mr. Tribble as our third appointee on the Upper Savannah Council of Government, please raise your right hand. That's a 7 0. Congratulations, Mr. Tribble. All right, the next is uh, this was this came to us last week. Um, I believe this is an annual event, Ms. Walsh, correct me if I say something incorrect. Uh, but basically, just authorizing or confirming that we want to continue to receive grants uh, and, uh, and represent us as a fiscal agent. I think Matt referenced earlier, he received grant money from the uh, Stand Up Council of Government for ENT uh, items. Uh, and we just basically, I'd like, uh, like to have a motion uh, to continue to work with the Upper Savannah and their grants department in accepting uh, grants and anything involving the local workforce development that they contribute to. Mr. Chairman, I move that we continue to work with the Upper Savannah Chicago government uh, to ensure grants and any other items that we may need at the county to improve the quality of life of the citizens of the county. Thank you for your motion, Ms. Anderson. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Carroll. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. That's 7 0. I think Mr. Mr. Bill mentioned to us on last meeting uh, some of the things that Dr. Savannah had done for the uh, school over in uh, Lydia Mill and I know Lydia Mill has been planned I know he made several other places and uh, we do get a lot of money from them and they are helped. All right, and thank you all three for your service on that board. I think Ms. Anderson, you on the executive board, that's uh, real important and a big deal for Lawrence County to have that representation. So thank you for your service there. Uh, next, we have a capital project sales tax sign request. So I'll call on Mr. Sackville. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is exciting to be part of the progress and, and pushing Lawrence County forward. And we want to uh, properly advertise our projects and, and how proud we are. I want to thank Courtney Snow of the uh, Sheriff's Department. Uh, when I need any kind of graphic ideas or graphics work done, she, she does a, an excellent job for us. In your packet is uh, three uh, signs that we are looking at. And uh, there's a reason they're in order. It was my favorite the first one. Uh, and then you have the second and third. But uh, there is two ask tonight. Number one, to, to decide which uh, sign you would like to go with if we, if we do this. And then what type of sign. And of course, I recommend the uh, aluminum sign uh, that is in the package. All right. Thank you, Mr. Satterfield. Um, I recommend we take these. Or first off, let me ask this question. If we do this, where is the money going to come from? Do you have a recommendation? My recommendation would be the Feed Those Special Projects Fund, which is set aside for uh, these types of purposes. Okay. All right. Um, I would like to see us take these in two items. First, if we desire to do signs, choose which style we're going to do, and then after that, we will determine which design we prefer. So this time, I will entertain a motion uh, to allow the 
public works director to purchase signs, at least specify which sign you prefer. You want a motion for the for which specific sign? No, no uh, well, he had only his recommendation to see he might not get all. He, he recommended corrugated plastic at 16 per sign, 18 yeah. by 24s, or, or a three by four aluminum sign, single sided at uh, 72 um, a piece. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the money's not to exceed $800, uh, and that would include eight signs with post and hardware. I will say uh, $72 for an alum three by four aluminum sign. Granted, is actually a very, very reasonable price. Um, I dabble on that a little bit with all my other work, and that's a, it's a, it's a real good price. I'll let you know who we're getting that from later. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion that we approve Mr. Stutterfield to purchase the sign that is chosen in the aluminum single side at $72, not to exceed $800, including eight signs of post market. All right, I have a motion from Mr. Hey, Carroll to approve the aluminum sign, not exceed eight hundred dollars. Just a yes, sir. Just point of clarification. I just confirmed with Andy, um, and I apologize, Dale, but uh, Andy's project is actually broken into multiple Got twenty-five parks, multiple parks around the county. I guess you can cut that three or four sign up to twenty-five pieces. <laughs> <laughs> well. And I was trying to assume that and we're, we're not going to be doing every project at the same time. That's correct. So I was trying to kind of envision, you know, we'd be moving signs from this project to that project as they are done and completed and we move to the next one. But well, let me ask this one. Uh, well, I do have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second when we enter discussion? Um, I'll second it for discussion. Okay. I, I, like to make, I, I, I want to amend it to. Uh, at least $1,000. Well, let me, let me offer a suggestion. Okay, um, I want to ask Andy, would the, for the parts, since there are one or so many, would 18 by 24 signs work for you, or would you prefer the larger one? What do you feel? I think a smaller sign would be fine for us. We use we have requirements for the grants that we get from PAR, Land Water Conservation Fund, um, and they're about 18 by 24 um, okay. that we have to display um, in perpetuity. Uh, and I think that should be the same thing with this. Uh, not just a building sign, but also a in perpetuity sign to say your penny sales tax paid for this. Um, so, uh, I mean, whichever sign is perfectly fine with me, but I think that that would be a convenient thing. And I don't, I don't think that it's necessary for me to ask y'all for the money in a one lump sum to do it. Because when I start on a project, I can get one sign. Um, I don't need them all at one time. So would you be able to acquire your sons? I, so. yeah. okay. I would like to have it. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I think it should be in perpetuity. I think it should be always signed and not just one big one. Right. And, and if I may, all right, okay. Hold on. Okay. Mr. Triple, I think, you know, we've all been through these campaigns and signs don't last forever. Thank you. Know, you. I was about to say that same point. Trip. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to have to have more than that size. So you, 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 know, you don't need to just have $200 to probably have 50% of that budget. Of, sales tax not to exceed twelve hundred dollars. All those in favor please raise your right hand. Six all those opposed no vote passes six to one with Mr. Rankin in opposition. All right now the phone marks that's your Dale phone marks about to happen. Now we gotta pick which signs we're gonna use. 
Um, I see a recommendation on how council might like proceed to do this. Uh, we can go through all seven and say which one we like, or we can vote on each one uh, ABC if we choose to. Um, what is the will of council? Anybody have a preference? I believe the size, the size of the sign is what you're going to No, no, no. Which we're now we're on the bill. Um, yeah. I'm in favor of the one that Mr. Satterfield suggested, which, which was the first one, the green and blue. Yeah. Is that correct? No, sir. No, well, that's not uh, the order. It's in there are different orders. Can you show us your recommendation? Uh, this one here. But it's at your pleasure. Okay. If you like the green and blue. Well, I was we'll go around the room. I'll start. I like the the green and blue one. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair. I like the green and blue. Yeah. Mr. Trill. Upper left. Upper left green and blue, Ms. Anderson. Pass. Yes. Green and blue. Sorry. Okay. Um, it seems that the name can look for me. I promise. Okay. I figured. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we seem to have consensus, so I will okay. uh, take a motion on which sign to. So approved. Mr. Carey, you have a motion? I make a motion that we approve the more penny is building this project green and blue sign. All right, I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Yance. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Six. All those opposed? Motion passes six to one. Councilman right in opposition. Thank you. All right, next we have approval of the county attorney's job description. I'll call on our HR director. Mr. Bolton, to elaborate for us. Tonight, uh, Chairman Patterson, uh, tonight I bring to the council, I bring before you the uh, job description for the county attorney. Uh, it became, we, we began the process of gathering all the information for the compensation study that we're about to embark on, and we realized we didn't have this particular uh, job description for this study, so I uh, we, we developed one, and this is what I'm presenting to you tonight for your consideration and approval. All right. So the purpose of this is to allow the uh, firm that we approved last meeting to give us a compensation. And now it's based off of the, a job, this job description. All right. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, did you look at it? It came I, from I, I drew it. <laughs> it came from me. <laughs> and, and, I, and I cut out a lot of things because there were some things I really didn't want to do, so I left those out. Now, this, this has kind of been in the works for a number of years. I think Mr. Kennedy and I worked on it gosh, probably four or five years ago, So, uh, but we didn't have a compensation study then. So if I'm limited to these items, I, I'm all in favor of it. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it is something that is needed because uh, – Finally, after 28 years, they're going to describe what my job is. So, uh, so my successor at some point in time will at least know what what, what they get into. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I, I like to see them up that weight lift from 20 pounds to 50. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking about that. 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 I was thinking all righty. Uh, Y'all heard recommendation from the uh, HR director. Do I have a motion to approve the county attorney's job description as presented? Motion to approve county attorney's job description. Second. Motion by Mr. Rankin, second by Mr. Carroll. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please vote by raising your right hand. 7 0. All right, there was the addition to, uh, to new business 8D. Uh, it was in your packet, it just did not make it to the cover sheet. Um, what that is, and I'm going to speak briefly, and I'll have a to elaborate any further. I spoke with uh, Doug Gillum uh, this week, or no, excuse me, in the last week, and they are working on putting together a um, Tri County Veterans Cemetery. Um, I think there's two locations being considered. The, the one they seem to be leaning to is in Cross Anchor, right over the county line, in Spartan, or I guess like a Union County there. Um, but Union, Lawrence, and Spartanburg are kind of coming together. Uh, they're not asking for any monetary. Um, the, this is going to be funneled to the state, but they're looking for a 
letter of support, and in your package you saw a letter of support that came from uh, the school district of Union County. Uh, it's my understanding they have received a similar letter from the school district in Clinton, March 56. And basically Doug was just asking for um, us to also, and by us, uh, county administrator, to write a letter of recommendation from Lawrence County in support of establishing this tri-county uh, veterans park. I'm sorry, veterans cemetery. Mr. Chairman, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, I think you've covered it. Um, Mr. Gilliam, uh, Representative Gilliam, um, did reach out to me and uh, I, I didn't think this was something I could or should do unilaterally. I wanted to get county council's consent on this. All right. Thank you. Well, I will make the motion for this one. Uh, oh. um, I make a motion to allow the county attorney to draft a letter of support uh, to Representative Gillum and the South Carolina Department of Veteran Affairs uh, for the county to support a tri county veterans park. Uh, so point of clarification, you said county attorney? County administrator. Yeah, that, was, that was not included in the job description. <laughs> it is, it is. I'm reading, I'm reading the county attorney on my desk. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, other dudes have described, Sandy. <laughs> um, so, let me rephrase my motion just for clarification purposes. I make a motion to allow the county administrator to draft a letter of support from Lawrence County to Representative Doug Gillum and the South Carolina Department of Veteran Affairs in support of a Tri County Veterans Cemetery. Second. I have a second from Mr. Carroll. Is there any discussion on the matter? Um, I believe, yes. Doug said he didn't contact them. They were full support of it. I have not personally contacted them, but Doug, Doug, delegation has. Anything further? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Motion passes to 7 to 0. That brings us to the end of our agenda. Uh, next is public comment. Did anybody sign up for public comment? Mr. Chairman, well, I'm right. seeing none. We'll move on to county council comments. And I'm going to change this up a little bit. I'm going to allow the county administrator to say a few words first if he has anything to say this evening. Well, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I have nothing. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Rankin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to say, uh, first of all, that uh, Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, all lives matter, especially the lives of innocent babies in the womb of their mother. For those of you who don't know, uh, the heartbeat bill is being debated and will be voted on this week, most likely in the state capitol. I'd like uh, the people of Horace County to be in prayer for that, that the right thing will, will happen. It failed in years past, as an opportunity to pass this week. I've uh, been reached out to by many constituents in my area who are very familiar with where my stance is on this position. And they want their voice to be heard in Columbia. And sometimes they don't know how. They come to their local representative for help, how they can get that, their voice heard. So I took liberty into drafting a letter, which is right here, uh, urging Columbia to pass this legislation. I have a copy for each one of my fellow colleagues here. I will pass out. Uh, I would just like to ask uh, my fellow colleagues to sign this letter showing their support that we stand for life in Lawrence County, and that we stand to protect that. All lives matter to God, and as Christians, as Americans, I think we all should get behind that. So with that, I will conclude my comments. Thank you, Mr. Rankin. Mr. Tribble. Nothing for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mr. Yance. Uh, I'll go back to those signs right quick. You got blue ones and big ones. I think whatever price you get, like the ag barn, that's going to be a pretty nice, that's going to be a big part, put a big sign. You know, make it look good. 
the smaller the size, the smaller the price. Just what I'm, just what I'm talking about. Right? Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. McDaniel. No comment. Ms. Anderson. I would like to thank the EMS employees for all the work they do to make, to look after the health and the welfare of all the citizens of Lawrence County. And just because I did not vote to make sure you get a raise, y'all know I have you back. And so I hope you know that. But uh, uh, it's just my conviction that when Lawrence County moves forward, I want everybody else in Lawrence County to move forward. And so, um, but I really appreciate all the work that you do. And I can't thank you enough for what you do and who you are. So thank you. It doesn't seem like enough, but I thank you for what you do. Thank you, Senator. Mr. And I'll echo those sentiments and I always think it's good to support you, but show you too with uh, tangible things. I'm glad we we're able to pass that for you tonight. It's not the answer, but it hopefully is something that shows support and that we can shore up some of what we have going on and uh, that we can move forward from that. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, I like uh, both of those sentiments. Uh, now we appreciate all the work EMS does, and it's been harder and harder, especially during this pandemic, uh, jumping through new hurdles. Um, I can't begin to battle uh, what you and your uh, colleagues go through. Um, I do want to say, I, I know you brought the council a few times, including in the committee meeting with reference about the 2472, and the council's continued to, to um, decide to go another direction. We would love to see another option. Um, and I, I do not know what that option is, but but I would encourage you to continue to evaluate the EMS in this county and what we might do to increase, uh, number one, care of our citizens. That is the number one priority, in my opinion, is to take care of our citizens when they are in need. So whatever you, you know, I know you had an idea here and the council said no, so, so bring something else, you know. Um, and I don't have that answer, and hopefully you can work with people around you and we can come with a good solution um, to do that. Uh, in regards to the study that uh, Ms. Anderson uh, referenced a few times this evening, uh, they're probably going to be well upset in the morning when they learned that we have the EMS paid and not anybody else's. Um, we actually began addressing that before the compensation study began. And honestly, the discussion for EMS kind of drove us looking to the compensation study for everyone else. Um, and I'm glad we were able to do that at the rate that we did. And I'm looking forward to getting that back as quickly as we're able to be able to uh, address it because normally some of those things take nine months to a year. So the, the fact that we were able to um, speed that up and then get a solid company that's familiar with this area uh, is going to be beneficial to all of our departments. Um, I know that we're not we're not at market on all of our departments. I'd argue we're not on, still in our market with EMS even with what we did this evening. Um, but we're doing our best to get everybody where they need to be. I'm looking forward to the data uh, the council can use to make a educated decision on the direction we need to go. Um, but just a reminder to everybody who's been mentioned tonight, practice social distancing, don't forget to wash your hands, be cognizant of your neighbors, um, do what we can to spread the virus. Our hospitals are still packed. Um, it's, it's, it's gotten a little bit better, but they're still full. Um, you know, it's better to be 100% than 133 where they were last Wednesday. Um, they're trying to uh, be patient uh, with our employees. I know we've restricted the physical normal people in the different offices. Uh, we all have business to conduct, but let's all work together and do our best and uh, do our part. So with that, that is all I have. Um, we do, that's all I have. Okay. So, so uh -huh. now I'll entertain a motion uh, to move into executive session uh, for contractual matters. You're good. Relating to uh, capital project sales tax. Do I have a motion? Motion to move into executive session for a uh, discussion of capital projects. Uh, okay. yes. Motion by Mr. McDaniel. Second. Second by Mr. Rankin. Um, time, do I, the time is now 7 Do I have a vote to move into executive session? Please raise your right hand. 7 0. We will reconvene in executive session at, at 7 20 based on the clock on the wall.
David left. I lost my house key, and so I had to use his key, and this is what he had. You got a majority? Yeah, we got a majority. Yeah, we got a majority. Not lose. Right. Yeah. Huge strike. I forgot. So, yeah, I don't think you and I have a choice. That's what I'm told. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm told. That's good. Here, how are they? I don't watch TV. I think we got it. Good lessons that we've learned from the airport this is how it's been. I think so too. Yeah, That's a good point. Well, you do need some guidelines. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm on the rail Mike's on? Yeah, I figured as much. But... Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Time is 8.34, and we are returning to the regular session. Uh, during the regular session, there uh, we discussed some contractual matter. 734. 734. Okay. I, I like the old better when they were. Um, <laughs> this is digital. Also. Yeah. Uh, we discussed the contractual matter related to CBSC uh, in the executive session. Uh, I don't believe there's any action that needs to be taken, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So, uh, motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. McCain. And by Mr. Care, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned 6 to 0. Nice.